Okay, hello again. I want to spend roughly around 20 minutes talking about Wheelock's Chapter 4, giving you a brief overview. Wheelock's Chapter 4 completes what's called the Second Declension. Remember, there was this, this great day on the Ides of March, March 15th, you know, 44 BC. Right after they'd killed Julius Caesar, all the Romans got together and they said, hey, let's divide up all Latin nouns into five buckets, five declensions, that, let's call them. And with this chapter, we like chapter four, you're going to finish the uh, second uh, declension. If you remember the first group, okay, all of the uh, A nouns, like Puella, I want you all to get over here. Um, and they were, almost everybody was feminine in that group, although there were four pain words, probably more than that, but four pain words, uh, Poeta, um, um, Agricola, Incola, and Nauta, you know, those four uh, they're actually masculine, but the, for whatever reason, they wanted to be over with that first group. And then uh, for chapters three and four of Wheelock, we've been talking about the second group. First group had most, mostly A, or a lot of A endings. The second group of nouns got together because they were U's and o, uh, O's in their endings primarily. Uh, and so the second declension is, prim is uh, the majority of nouns in the second declension, shall we say, are masculine. However, there's a large neuter minority uh, within uh, that. So chapter 3 of Wheelock gave you the second declension masculine forms. And now in, in chapter 4, Caput uh, 4 of Wheelock, he's going to give you the neuters of the um, uh, second declension. Well, first, so let's, let's begin with a little bit of review here. So, here is chapter 3. Remember these masculine endings. Now normally, you know, this is this is like you're in a cadaver lab and they've cut off the uh, the endings. I don't know whether that's the feet or the buttocks, but anyway, we're looking at kind of a, a uh, this, oh, gross, you've taken the word off. Um, but these are the endings of, of these nouns. So uh, uh, normally you'd see this on a word like deus, God. Um, so us is the masculine singular ending if a word is the subject and it's nominative singular uh, like that uh, it's going to be um, am amicus the word for a male friend it's going to have an us ending if it's nominative if it's a subject singular the plural is long i e um, so um, amici would be the the fr male friends as the subject of the sentence and then, uh, unfortunately, Latin used the long I ending for the genitive singular too, of a friend, amici, of a friend. So amici could be either be the subject, friends don't let friends drink and drive, you know, or amici could be, this is the book, amici, of a friend. Um, context will have to help you know which it is. Orum, uh, genitive plural, of friends, or of whatever the masculine plural word is. Uh, deorum, of the gods. Um, Long O uh, could be either a dative singular or an ablative singular. If it's a dative singular, then probably the word to, T-O, will jump out of it. I gave this amico, to a friend. Could also be for a friend, you know, two or four are the, kind of the options for what will spring forth from a dative ending. And then is uh, is the dative plural. Uh, is is also the ablative plural. The ablative, the O and is there, tend to be uh, with a preposition, so like uh, sine amico would be without a friend, or sine amicis would be without friends. Uh, so uh, the ablative can be an ablative of means, so by means of something. Um, so I'm reviewing. This is all hopefully sounding like something you learned in Chapter 3. Then the accusative of the second de declension uh, noun is going to be um. I see a friend, amicum. Uh, as the direct object, or I see friends, amicos, is going to be the ending there. And then I hate even to put the vocative on. The vocative is most of the time the same as uh, the nominative. Um, actually, this is the one place where it isn't. The vocative singular masculine, amica, amica, friend, lend me some money. Uh, that would be vocative singular uh, masculine. Um, and then the plural is like the nominative. Okay. Hopefully that's all review. That's what you learned in Chapter 3 if you have a photographic memory or put in the time. Now, meet the neuters. Um, I have What I've done here is I have put exactly the same paradigm that I had on the previous slide, but I have added 
the second declension neuter forms where they are different. So you'll notice that there are actually only five places where I have put a different form. In all the other places, um, the neuter uh, second declension noun endings are going to be exactly the same as the um, masculine second declension ending. So um, the vocative, we can, you know, just ignore the vocative because you'll notice in this case the vocative is exactly the same as the nominative. The same in the feminine. If you remember in the first declension, you know, the vocative was exactly the same as the nominative. And also with the neuters, uh, the vocative is going to be exactly the same uh, as the, the nominative. So don't waste your brain space learning the... So that brings us down to three, uh, 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 three distinct endings. Now, the, the nominative neuter ending uh, singular is um. Uh, so like donum, uh, a gift. Uh, that's not an accusative form necessarily. Donum could be a, a nominative form. Why? Because it's neuter. And then, by the way, here, here is something to bank on. It is not often in languages that there are rules without exceptions. But here is a rule without exception. The nominative and accusative will always, always, always look the same for a neuter noun. For a neuter noun, this works in Greek, by the way, as well. The the nominative, uh, classical Greek, the nominative and accusative of a neuter noun always looks the same. And it is always involving an A uh, in Latin. Actually, in even in Greek, uh, it always involves an alpha somewhere in there. Uh, so you, you get two languages for the price of one. So the neuters are pretty nice. Neuters don't take a lot of extra brain space because they are basically masculines with a twist. Uh, and I have all kinds of inappropriate ideas that go into my head when I say things like that, but I am going to be the better man and not um, uh, say them. Okay, so um, there are actually very few variations here uh, on the masculine. Uh, it's pretty much the same. The genitive is the same. The dative is the same. The ablative is the same. Uh, between the masculine and the neuter endings. The only thing that's different is the nominative form has an um. And actually, you can remember that easy because as soon as you learn, and I'm sorry we're saving money here, my light always goes out when I'm talking to my computer, um, but uh, you're going to learn that neuter singular form just by uh, memorizing vocabulary. Um, and so the nominative accusative is going to be the same. Um, and then the neuter plural a if you can somehow remember that. It shouldn't be that hard because there are actually, and, and here, here's application, we actually uh, use the A uh, in, in English uh, for a plural of a Latin word. Boy, if I can, if I can think of one. Um, well, data. Um, have you ever known anybody, uh, there are a few snooty people who insist on saying one datum uh, is singular, but if I'm talking about data, uh, that's plural. Well, the U-M is the neuter uh, singular form, and data with an A is the neuter plural A. So think data, and you've got the neuter plural. There are, there are people who do that. Um, um, I wish I could think of another. Uh, you'll come up with one. Uh, places where a neuter plural has an A, where, it's, where we're using a word in English that's actually of Latin uh, origin. Okay, so I hope that's easy. That is pretty much it for this chapter. If you've got that, you have the bulk of this chapter. But let's put it all into a grand unified theory. Adjectives, as you know, have to match the noun they go with in case, number, and gender. That means that nouns nouns have the luxury of only having one gender. A noun only has one gender. You know, So you go up to a noun, you're meeting a new noun for the first time, you say, hey, so what is your gender? You know, If, if the answer is feminine, then that noun is always going to be feminine. If the noun answers, well, I'm a neuter, it's going to always be neuter. If the, new, if the noun is masculine, it's going to always be masculine. Adjectives, however, have to be more flexible uh, than that. Masculines ha uh, adjectives have to be able to go with masculine words. Uh, adjectives have to be able to go with feminine words. And adjectives have to be able to go with neuter words. And so um, adjectives have to have masculine, feminine, and neuter forms. So if you can learn this chart that I have in front of you, which takes all the endings of the first and second declension and puts them into a nice little chart. If you can memorize this chart, then you have the bulk of chapters 2, 3, and 4 uh, in Wheelock. I wish I had a nice song uh, to seal the deal. You know, us, uh, um, e, i, e, you know, or I don't know, or, uh, 
I, 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 um, I don't know. I, I can't been able to come up with us, uh, um, e, i, e, o, i, o, 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 um, 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 o, a, uh, o. I, you know, I haven't come up with one that works. Uh, maybe you can come up with one. When I learned it, I just learned it by rote. You know, walking around campus, going us, uh, um, e, i, e, you know, and then you hit your head with the Latin book which, if you have Wheelock, is thankfully paperback. But anyway, if you can memorize this chart, uh, you will have the, the chapters 2 uh, through uh, 4. Okay, there are a couple other little things here. It's kind of like um, these chapters are... I mean, Wheelock is just the best language book I've ever, I can, I know of. Um, so he starts with the big picture, and then there's this kind of little detailed stuff at the end if you have enough brain space left. You know, and if you're like that guy in the far side, uh, you know, cartoon with a small head, you can say, my brain is full, may be excused early. Uh, but here we have uh, the present of some. Now, the, the nice thing is you already know Est, right? He is already, I mean, this is brilliant. He has already given you the most important form of sum that you need to know, and that is Est, which means he, she, or it is. Um, so um, these are the forms. Now, if you've had another language, um, then you know that languages kind of do this with, with um, uh, yo hablo, tu hablas, you know, you, you know that languages change a little bit. Um, um, so here is uh, I am, you are, he, she, or it is. So sum es, and I just I learned it by saying it. Sum es est, sum es est sunt, sum es est, sum es est sunt. You know, I am sum. Uh, I think, therefore, I am. Do you know this from philosophy? Cogito ergo sum. Cogito, I think. Ergo, therefore, sum, I am. Cogito ergo sum. Sum, I am. S, you are. Same as Spanish. Um, well, that actually it might be he is in Spanish. Forget I said that. Est, he, she, or it is. A, he, she, or it is. No, it could be Tom is. Uh, sumus, we are. Estus, y'all are. And sunt, they are. Sunt would be the second one you know, to learn of these, because, you know, that we, we talk most, I think, in the third person when we write. And, of course, essa. Essa means to be. So I've joked here, uh, because I'm corny, essa, out non essa, to be or not to be. Uh, essa means uh, to be. And, of course, if you know any philosophy of uh, Thomas Aquinas, you know, he talks about essa, being, uh, to, the to being. Um, he wrote a book called uh, Essa et Essentia, I think, to essence, uh, being and essence. I won't get into that, but um, it's helpful to know these uh, Latin words if you're doing a little philosophy on the side. Okay, odds and ends in this chapter. Again, we're trailing out, you know, can I just slip one more person into the elevator? Well, here, here are a couple of things to, to fit in the elevator if you can at all cram them in, maybe make them, you know, get down on the floor. Um, so, a, a predicate noun or a predicate adjective, it's something you uh, allegedly learned in high school or middle school English, however it may not have stuck. It's something that you really don't have to know what it's called uh, to use it. But basically, um, we've learned about direct objects, right? He hits what? He hits the ball, direct object. However, with being verbs, with linking verbs, we don't really have a object of action, because in being, there isn't action. Uh, there is being, there is doing, there is being. Uh, in being verbs, um, you don't have a direct object because there's no action. And so we call a word that comes after a to-be verb, like is, am, are, was, will be, uh, become even. We, we call that a predicate noun or a predicate adjective. Two examples, and again, this is something where if you don't know the name for it, you're probably going to do just fine anyway. But uh, so the, in the example, amikai uh, sunt uh, bonai, um, friends, and here we're talking about girlfriends, um, not necessarily girlfriend, but friends that are girls. Um, friends are good, and they're girl be, because amikai is feminine. So uh, sunt, you now know, they are. And it's the they here are girlfriends. Um, and boni is nominative. What, you, your, your first thought might be, well, why is boni nominative? Shouldn't it be accusative because it comes after the verb? No, because this is not an, an action verb. This is a being verb. So the, the to be verb is like an equal sign as far as case goes. So friends equal good. And that is a predicate adjective uh, because 
Uh, it is not the subject, but it's the predicate. It is a nominative, um, but but it's um, after the verb. Boni is an adjective, so we call it a predi- predicate adjective. It's an adjective that's a predicate following a to-be verb. Again, you wouldn't have to understand anything I just said, probably, to translate that correctly. Uh, Virgilius est poeta. Um, Virgil is a poet. Now here, poet is not an adjective describing friends. It is a noun. It's telling you what Virgil is. He is a poet. And uh, it may look like these to- don't match in gender. Virgilius looks ma- masculine. Poeta looks feminine. But remember, the P in pain is the poet. Uh, and so uh, Poeta is a, again, forgive me, a transvestite noun. It looks feminine, but it's actually masculine. Um, so it does actually match in case, and number, and gender. And it's nominative because of this equal sign of the verb est. Those are predicate and nouns and predicate adjectives because they come after a to be verb. Again, you should you could probably translate that without knowing what to what to call it in grammar class. Okay. By the way, that this this is meant to prove that you often will learn more about English um, from learning Latin than you did from your English class. Maybe not true, but okay. Last detail of this chapter: uh, something called substantive adjectives. There are three uses of an adjective uh, in these dead languages, like Greek and Latin. Um, the first one is the one that you don't need to be told what it is to get it right. Attributive adjectives. The good man, uh, which would be something like uh, weir bonus, um, man good, because again in Latin they tend to put the adjective after uh, the noun. That's We know that. That's normal. You've been doing that in all these chapters. Just fine, thank you. Uh, so you get attributive ad- adjectives. That's what we call the ones we've been doing all along. Well, you just, in the previous slide, learned about the predicative use of an adjective, predicate now, uh, pre- predicate adjective. So if I say puella est bona, I'm saying the girl is good, bona is nominative, um, it's an adjective that comes after to be verb. Now, thankfully, uh, Latin uses the to be verb, um, I think, most of the time, almost all the time. Uh, if we were doing Greek, we would have to get used to the fact that a lot of times it doesn't put the to-be verb in there. But I'm doing therapy from another part of my life. So let me move on. Uh, This chapter introduces you to something called the substantive use of an adjective. Now that's where the noun that the adjective is telling you about isn't there. You have to infer what noun it's talking about. You have to make it up. You have to to reach into your heart of hearts and pull a noun out of the adjective. So um, we do this in English with plurals like the good people, the bad people, the ugly people, you know. We do this, you know, the rich people, the famous people. We, we do this substantive use of an adjective in English, but we tend to only do it with plurals. I can't think of any examples where we do that with a singular. Um, so um, a lot of times you're going to do okay simply to translate uh, a substantive plural as the good. Um, however, uh, the adjective will have a gender. Uh, and so if it's, um, um, let me think, uh, awar- awari is the rich men, uh, awari uh, are the rich, or I'm sorry, greedy, awari, uh, the, the greedy men, awari, the greedy women, and awara would be the greedy trees or whatever, something neuter. Um, so you sometimes, even with a plural, will want to invent a noun like men, women, things, you know, uh, because uh, to fill out the meaning. Um, if you just put the good uh, and the the it's uh, and it's boni, where it's talking about good women, you know, you've you've lost some meaning in your translation. You're going to want to put women in there, maybe in brackets. Uh, if you're a purist, you don't have to. But um, so. Uh, the context, here's the bottom line, the context will clue you in on what these good masculine things are or what these good feminine things are or what these good neuter things are and the noun's not actually there. The context will clue you in on what kind of word, you, you noun you need to put in there to complete, uh, complete the meaning. Uh, so often, sometimes in English, you don't have to go ahead and put the noun, but often you will need to supply a noun, especially with singulars. Because if you say the good in English, uh, and it's a good man in Latin, um, that's not the way it's going to sound in English. The good uh, sounds like either the good... 
Now, actually, there's a you could say the good thing, goodness, uh, the good as a singular substantive there. But um, usually, if you say the good, don't do that. Um, you you're going to think plural. And, and so when when the when a Latin uh, ad, when a Latin adjective is used substantively um, in the singular, you're going to want to either put in um, a man, woman, or 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 whatever the thing in the context is. So uh, bonas laudant, uh, bonas. I should have had a long mark over the a. Sorry. They praise good women uh, or whatever feminine thing in the context it's been talking about. And so we have to come up with the word women because it's not there in the Latin. Again, if you have any questions about what I just said, Wheelock is your uh, uh, watchword and song. Thank you. This has been Chapter 4 of Wheelock's Latin.